great question because that's exactly what I've just spoken about, about the importance of Indonesia for Australia um, is exactly the reason why this dialogue matters. Uh, Indonesia and Australia both look north in terms of anticipating threats and priorities. Unfortunately, that means Indonesia looks north towards the rest of Asia, uh, is always concerned about what's happening in that region. Australia looks north too. We quite inaccurately and wrongly, there's a public expectation of the possibility of threat from Indonesia, which is completely unfounded. Mm. But when we look north, we also look north in the sense of a leapfrog. Our attention goes way north, all the way to Europe and the United States, when the, one of the countries that will have the most impact on Australia in the next 20 years is way, way closer than uh, the Western world, which we've been so closely associated with in cultural tradition. Uh, in a sense, if you could look at the mental mind map of Australians, we would be a sort of small island in the mid-Atlantic between England and America. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, we're not. We're a big, empty island at the, the southern end of Asia. We have to really become aware of that. What this dialogue was about was to say, we're at a moment, a historic moment in the Asia century, where we need to do some things pretty quickly about our relationship with Indonesia to set ourselves up for this, the, the wealth and prosperity that will be emerging in Indonesia in the next 20 years. The fact that Indonesia is going to become one of those BRIC countries, mm. it's hard to think about now. It's hard to imagine mm. that this country with great poverty still, mm. maybe half of its population or more in a state of poverty, uh, weaknesses in infrastructure spread across um, 17,000 islands. It's hard to imagine that this is going to be one of the biggest economies in the world in, by 2020. And yet it is. No more surprising than if in 1998 he had said to observers, Indonesia would be the most open, vibrant democracy, no longer a military autocracy yeah. in 10 years, yeah. in fact, five years. Yeah. And yet that's what happened. So that's going to happen with the economy. Mm. But what this dialogue from an Australian perspective is about was we need to do something, we need to do something now, we haven't been getting it right. It's a historic moment, we need to invest more in this relationship. From an Indonesian perspective, it's don't forget us down here in the south, you know, mm. Australia. Mm. Indonesians can do a lot more and benefit a lot more from our relationship. We're an advanced, developed economy. They're a fast developing but still underdeveloped economy. Uh, there's a lot that can be learned in innovation and science and technology from us. And of course, education. The single largest body of Indonesian students outside Indonesia is Australia, 18,000 at the moment. Um, there's much that Australia has to offer, but very little is being done about it, not enough. So it's in both our countries' mutual interests to build closer bridges of cooperation and understanding. Mm. Uh, and if we don't do it, we're both going to pay for it. Mm. So uh, what, what we've done in this dialogue is, is bring people from a whole range of sectors, from youth, from education, from business, from government, um, from science and technology. In Indonesia and Australia have a range of uh, ages, a, a range of backgrounds, bring them together to talk about what matters, what the priorities are and what to do next. And let's hope the governments are listening. Something terribly bad has gone wrong in public policy on education in Australia when it comes to languages. Australia is the lowest ranked of all OECD countries for second language skills. We rank behind even the US and Japan, both well known for their, the homogeneity of Japan's case of its society, in America's case its uh, lack of language skills. The US has Hispanic populations, mm -hmm. so it, that puts the US ahead of us. We are right at the end of the pack the lowest level of language skills, and yet we're a Western country, it's not in the West, mm. we're in Asia. Mm. Uh, in fact, we, we used to be much better at this, mm. and despite multiculturalism and much wanted engagement with Asia, we've gone it. Mm. In, 19, in, the, in the early 1970s, when Australia was still under the white Australia policy, more kids at year 12 were learning Indonesian than now. How on earth did it happen in Asia century? at a time when we have Indonesia as a democracy, everything. There were more kids learning about Indonesia when it was a military autocracy under Suharto than there are when it's an open democracy. Mm. Something's gone badly mm. wrong. As a result now, the Department of Education, the Commonwealth, the Federal Department of Education in Australia says in eight years on its own stats, 
Indonesian will be learning Spanish from the schools. As it is, 100,000 kids a year from kindergarten to year 12 drop in Indonesian. Mm. Now, there's a whole range of reasons for this, uh, and they're complex. Mm. One of them is um, the, the image of Indonesia, the constant presentation of Indonesia as a scene of disaster. Uh, Bali bombings, Australians in Indonesian jails, um, a whole range of earthquakes, uh, I can hear music. A whole range of, of bombings. I'll start this again. There's a whole range of issues that are done. They're complex here. Some of them, one is uh, the terrorism and the Bali bombings and other attacks. Another is national, natural disasters, earthquakes, the tsunami in Aceh. Um, then there's, of course, the Australians of Indonesia, jails and the various crises attached to those, asylum seeker issues. All of these mean Indonesia is too often a bad news story on our screens. We need to do something about that. We need to tell the real Indonesian story. Of course there's crisis and disaster in Indonesia. If you dropped it on the European map, it would run from Moscow to England, mm. to London. Yeah. A lot happens. You imagine if you treated that as one country in yeah. Europe, of course it would be full of disasters. Yeah. Yeah. That's true with Indonesia. But that's not the real Indonesian story. It's not the lived experience of Indonesians. But what it does mean is that uh, a lot of people are still scared of it because of the old stereotypes. Secondly, um, as languages decline in schools, they tend to go with what they're familiar with. Mm. European languages that are not really relevant for Australia in the Asia century. French, German, Italian, because that's what Europeans used to study. Uh, and finally, there's a big generational change going on um, in, amongst the teachers of Indonesia. And because languages are falling, people are leaving it, the new teachers aren't moving back in. So we need to do a whole lot of things here. We need to put money in as incentives into schools to make schools want to offer Indonesian. We want to retrain teachers and bring them back in again. Um, we need to make it attractive for kids to do it by giving them hex credits at mm. universities, bonuses in the year 12 exams, all those mm. sort of things. Uh, because we're in a state of emergency. How can we manage a relationship with this critically important country if no one can speak the language? The answer you often get is, well, everyone's learning English. Not in this, not in Indonesia, they're not. Mm. You try getting around the country without a word of Indonesian. Mm. Uh, people have this perception because more educated elite people are learning English that the language, the local language doesn't matter. Well, it does if you really want to engage. If you want to be the only person in the room when a contract's been negotiated who can't understand what everyone's saying, that's fine, but you're not going to make a lot of money. And that's true right across the board. Language is the key to negotiating relationships and also to understanding and being able to build strategies. Um, you can't get culture without language. Mm -hmm. So we need to do something about it. It means money. All of this means money. Governments have to invest. They have to understand age as a priority. Um, so far, they're not. The Australian government, under uh, in the Keating era, had the uh, NALSAS program that mm -hmm. subsidised Asian languages. That was cut during the first term of the Howard government. The Howard government, uh, sorry, the Rudd government, when Labor came back in, reintroduced uh, an Asian languages subsidy called NALS. Mm. It was about a fifth in size of mm. the previous one, not enough, but it was better than nothing. In the May budget this year, it was not renewed. Mm. So we're back to zero. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a crisis.